What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to another Thursday video with myself and my man Noah at FBGod on Twitter. Make sure you're following us both. It's another Q&A. So we're taking some questions from Patreon. We're taking some questions from Twitter because we didn't get enough on Patreon. I'm assuming it's because y'all took our advice and are no longer in the playoffs, so you don't need our advice anymore. But we're a man of the people. We are manses of the people. So we reached out to Twitter. We reached out to Instagram. We're pulling questions from all over the globe, and we're here to hopefully help, hopefully um, get you that first win in the first round of the playoffs. What's up, Noah? Speak to the people. How are we doing? How's your week going so far? Give me some highlights. Give me some some bad things going on in your life. What's good? Well, the Chargers won, so that's a good thing. Happy about that. Uh, rolling. I mean, they kind of got lucky against the Steelers on that false start that, like, didn't count but counted. Who knows? A lot of outrage. Yeah, so. yeah. That was a messy a messy situation. I mean, as, as, a, as a fan – you can't really be mad at that, but I don't understand what – did the NFL come out and, like, apologize about that? Was there any statement afterwards? I didn't see. I didn't see. I kind of tried to avoid that just so I could, like, justify being happy about that win. Yeah, so. I hear you. Take what you can get. <laughs> I got yeah. you. Um, so, you got you got to have finals coming up soon, right? Yeah, next week. Ooh, you're studying? Does that mean you're not going out this weekend? No, nah, I'm not. Staying in. Got to Boo. be a good boy, you know? Boo this man. What uh, What year are you? I'm a sophomore. You're a sophomore, man. We got some youngins on the show right now. <laughs> so I, I wanted to, I want to give the people more of a, a little bit of a personal, personal background of you because I don't know how, how much they know about you. So I'm kind of figuring out as we go along as well. But this is a fantasy football channel podcast. Wherever you are listening, thank you for joining us. If you find the video valuable, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe if you are new. Uh, we'll be doing this all the way through the chip week as well as in the off season. And speaking of that, I need you guys to uh, let me know what kind of content you want to see in the off season. So drop a comment down below, letting us know, and we will dive in right after the intro. All right. So the first question comes in from Danny a patron he asks if i can get a hold of justin jackson should i play him over eckler he looked better on the field sunday and i don't want to take any risks or play jeff wilson versus denver since matt Breida is out for this week half ppr league he also asks should i play buffalo at home versus the jets or the giants away against the redskins standard league so the first question is pretty much justin jackson eckler jeff wilson in a half ppr league where are your thoughts on that noah well, I think Jeff Wilson is probably the most guaranteed to get touches. I mean, Matt Breed is out. All they have left is Alfred Morris and Matt Days, who's a special teams player. And we saw last week Jeff Wilson was heavily involved in the passing game because Nick Mullins is afraid to kind of throw it deep. Mm -hmm. He only looks two ways. He looks at uh, George Kittle, Jeff Wilson, and he looked at Dante Pettis a few times. So I think he's like a lock to get five, six targets in the passing game just because that Denver pass rush is just going to ruin Mullen's day. He's going to have to dump it off real quick. But I think if you're shooting for upside, which in your fantasy playoffs out of your RB2, that's maybe like what you're looking for, you got to kind of lean at the Eckler and Jackson side. That matchup against the Bengals, they give up so many points. I think they're the softest like run defense in the league in terms of fantasy points given up. Uh, Jackson obviously looked better last week, but they still gave Eckler 18 touches. I mean, his 13 carries went for – no yards at all. And as a Chargers fan, I was kind of disappointed. I wanted to see what the little bald guy could do in space. But they ran him up the middle, took a little page out of Mike McCoy's playbook. Um, I just think he's guaranteed – Eckler is guaranteed to see like five, six catches on like eight targets because they're still going to use him. Uh, Anthony Lynn said uh, this week that they kind of want to mix in Jackson more because at heart Eckler is a special teams player because, you know, he's so gritty and all that. But, yeah, that was like a that was a kind of ridiculous like report or statement, I guess, that he's like tired already. It's like Eckler's been seeing like, I don't know, eight touches a game. I understand that he's like a special teams player, but like he's fucking not. He's like their RB2 who gets a lot of, of touches. But I, I'm kind of with you there. I feel like my gut is kind of – my gut is telling me Jeff, uh, Jeff Wilson actually on this. But my gut's also told me a, a lot of – bad things in my lifetime and I'm going to actually stay away from my gut and go more towards my brain. I think just based on the fact that they are playing the Bengals, like you said, and the Bengals have just been so bad against running backs. 
Um, and I have some numbers here. Over their last seven games, this is what they're doing. This is what they're allowing on the ground to running backs. So you have James Conner, 19 for 111, two touchdowns. Kareem Hunt, 15 for 86 and a touchdown. Peyton Barber, 19 for 85, a touchdown. Kamara Ingram, 25 for 160, two touchdowns. Gus Edwards, 17 for 115, touchdown. Nick Chubb, 28, 84, one. Philip Lindsay, last week, obviously 19, 157, two. Those are all ground numbers, not even getting the ball through the air. So running backs on the ground are absolutely killing them. And I think based off last week, we're seeing Justin Jackson probably is going to be the guy, right? Eckler did dominate snaps and touches and things in that game. But over the second half of the game, right, Jackson didn't even get his first carry, I think, until the second half. Um, and that kind of seems more likely as to what's going to happen in this game. And I think just the game script is so much more favorable in terms of um, Justin Jackson's outlook for this week because they are 14-point favorites against the Cincinnati team. It's the reason why they're probably going to rest Melvin Gordon for another week. They're not going to need him against this team. So I could totally see – uh, you know, them getting up really big, really quickly, and then not seeing a lot of use for Eckler. Uh, I, I do think that it's going to be like my rankings with them two are, if I had to guess, they're probably both going to be within like the RB 14, 15, you know, somewhere from like 13 to 16 range. Um, so I think both of them are good players. I think both of them can be in your lineup, to be honest with you. And they're going to lean heavily on their running backs in this game. Um, if I had to choose one, yeah, I would probably lean towards. Justin Jackson, because I think the game script is there. Um, he just looked really good last game, and, and there's no way that he doesn't get a substantial number of touches versus this offense or this defense in a, in a game where they should kind of sweep the, the defense away. Yeah, Peyton Barber. I mean, the fact that he went for 85 and a touchdown against this defense is really telling because that guy sucks. He is like the worst running back <laughs> I've ever seen. Yeah, he is. And really uh, guy. another thing is, I believe you put out a tweet about Philip Rivers' pass attempts and Games where they're favorites, but I think, what was it, like seven and a half points or something? He doesn't no, throw no, the ball. You guys are, you guys are um, I, I'm going to touch on the Rivers tweet later, but it's just like the splits in terms of when the Chargers win big, right? And they're such heavy favorites this week. So it's like his pass attempt numbers take a huge dip, which obviously in turn is going to hurt. The other thing that you mentioned that was a good point that I didn't think of with Jeff Wilson is, you know, he got nine targets last week, caught eight of them. I think, I think those were his final numbers. Like having Goodwin out, Marquise Goodwin, having Pierre Garcon out, right, doesn't leave – Mullins with a lot of um, outside weapons. So like you said, he's not going to take these deep shots down the field necessarily. And that leads to a lot more dump off. So I honestly think all of these guys are probably top 20 running back plays. Wilson more so on the volume, uh, the other two based on the matchups. But um, yeah, I think my final, my final say would probably be get uh, Jackson in your lineup. Where are you feeling? Jackson too? Yeah, I'm kind of leaning Jackson. Um, the Bengals allow the most rushing attempts per game. And as you said, they're huge favorites. They're probably just going to lean on him. He looked awesome against uh, Pittsburgh, who doesn't give up a lot of rushing yards. He broke a ton of big runs uh, against them and even against Arizona. But Arizona, they're terrible yeah. too. Eckler was going to get work in the passing game, but I think it just like won't rival what Jackson's going to do on the ground. And as for Wilson, he's just a floor play. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we're all on the same page here. Justin Jackson is our pick, but neither of them are bad picks. Um, and your second question was Buffalo – Defense versus the Jets at home or the Giants at Washington. Uh, my initial reaction was like, I love the Buffalo defense this week. I think they're set up to have uh, kind of a monster week on the defensive side of things. But the more I look at it, it's like, am I overthinking this? Am I like, it's like, do I make fantasy football too hard by even and uh, like analyzing this because the Giants are playing the Redskins who don't have a fucking quarterback right now. Where do you, where do you sit with this? Like, who, who are you playing if, if you're starting a defense here? Let me, let me say this right now. Vontae Davis is coming out of retirement to pick off Sam Darnold this Sunday. Oh, my God. It, it's it's <laughs> going to be a mess. There's no chance that Sam Darnold throws less than three interceptions. Okay. Yeah. That's where coming I was. A foot injury and all this? I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm looking at the spreads, the over-unders, and things like that, because as I always advocate for, you want to look for the favorite, of course. You want to look for teams that are at home, and you want to look for low over-under totals. And both of them are minus three and a half points. So both of them are three and a half point favorites this week, Buffalo and the Giants. Um, the Buffalo game has a lower over-under total, 38 and a half versus 41 and a half for the Giants-Redskins game. And the Giants are on the road. It's something I just don't like to – um, start in my defensive slot because I think people just underestimate whenever they're streaming positions, whether it's quarterbacks or defenses, they underestimate the impact that home field advantage really has. It's a six point swing according to Vegas. So um, that being considered, I do go with Buffalo because they're strong. Well, well, we'll look at like the matchup here, right? Like Buffalo's strong point on defense is their passing game, right? They don't allow points to opposing quarterbacks. 
Um, and the Jets don't have a running game, so I'm not worried about them beating them via the run. Darnold is this rookie who's coming off, you know, multi-week injury absence, and he's just a fucking turnover machine. So um, I, I like the matchup that we have there in terms of Buffalo being able to take away, you know, not their strong point, but if they're going to lean one way, it's going to be in Darnold, and I totally agree with you that I could see Darnold throwing up multiple interceptions, probably getting strip sacked a couple times. So I like Buffalo, three-and-a-half point favorites, 38-and-a-half over under at home, Bills Mafia going to fucking show out as they always do for those AFC East matchups. Um, so Buffalo it is. Yeah, they're going to be throwing shit all over the field. I mean, Darnold's just going to be in a world of hurt in this Sunday. I mean, I don't want to watch this game. It's going to be a bloodbath. No, you couldn't fucking pay me to watch this game. <laughs> it's going to be disgusting. All right, so we'll move on to the second question from our man, Richard Yu. Oi, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sorry, Rich. You're going to have to comment down below. Let me know how, how fucking wrong I just was on that. So he says, sup, Nick and Noah, standard league. Start two running backs, Aaron Jones, Sonny Michelle, Spencer Ware. <laughs> then he asks Tyler Boyd or DJ Moore. And then he says, Njoku is killing me. Vance McDonald or Austin Hooper. Thanks, fellas. And how do you feel about Jalen Samuels? So we got about 17 questions in there. We're going to try to break them down one by one for y'all. First question, start two running backs in standard, Aaron Jones, Sonny Michelle, Spencer Ware. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm sure we're not in disagreement here where Aaron Jones has got to be locked into one of those running back mm -hmm. roles. I don't think the Mike McCarthy, you know, switch up really has any effect on his outlook. He's scored six times in the last four games, super involved in the passing game. They got a ridiculously good matchup against uh, Atlanta. So um, Jones has to be the locked in RB1, right? And who are you taking at RB2? I'm going to rock with Michelle as my second option here. I just think where last week everybody thought he was going to get like an 85% snap share and just dominate everything. He wasn't using the passing game. They threw a whole lot on the goal line, whereas like that's where you want his value to come from, especially this being a standard league. And they're going up against Baltimore, who I believe have given up like four or three rushing touchdowns this year and only more than 60 rushing yards twice. And that was to like James Conner and Joe Mixon. I just don't think he's going to get the workload in a bad matchup to be viable over Sony Michelle. I mean, everybody's making a big deal about Rex Burkhead coming back, but Michelle was on the field for 41% of the snaps, and his range without Burkhead on the field was in between 41 and 47%. So it's not like he really got a huge downgrade. I know his day didn't look good because he got two goal line carries stolen by James Devlin. But if you watch the game, Michelle was given the first goal line carry on the first one that was vultured by that gritty guy, Devlin, who was going to be a top 10 pick next year. So I think you still got to have a lot of hope in Michelle. Yeah, I think you're right on that point. Like, had those had those goal line carries just gone to Michelle, this wouldn't even be a discussion right now, pretty much. Um, and I'm with you there. I would definitely go with Michelle as the RB2. Uh, we, I mean, we've seen him go against Miami earlier this year. They played him in week four. Michelle had 25 carries, like 110, 112 yards and a touchdown. I think they're going to have a very similar game plan because Miami is just not good at stopping the run. They're going to lean heavy on Michelle. Um, and I also think, like you said, it's, it's almost like – you know, I, I don't necessarily love either of these plays. I don't necessarily hate either of these plays, but I would much rather have Michelle over Ware just because, you know, Ware was some – I was super high on Ware going into last week, and he was not involved in the passing game. Um, he did get the carries, but how, you know, how significant really is that in terms of fantasy football if you're not involved in the passing game? And now they bring on, you know, Chark West. Chark West, the, the KCOG, is back on the roster, right? And you know he's getting snaps. You know he's probably going <laughs> to catch a few balls over there. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about that wear matchup, you know, like you said, against Baltimore. So I'm rolling Michelle as well. I think they, they go ground heavy again. And he's someone who, you know, as long as he is healthy, they're giving him about 20 touches a game. Another yeah. thing about Burkhead is people are saying like, oh, maybe they were just easing him into the offense. He's still got seven carries and like one target or two targets, one reception though. It's not like that's something unusual or something that like you think that's going to like increase dramatically over the next few weeks if that's easing him in like I don't know he's not going to get a role much bigger than that so I don't think that was really easing him in he was on yeah. IR for a long time for like a neck injury that didn't put him out for the year I think he was like he could have played a couple of weeks ago and that's just gonna be his role like five to eight touches a game nothing really like scary in terms of taking away from Michelle Right. It's almost, they're almost in similar situations. If you think about it, they're both like kind of in running back by committees. Um, but I think Michelle is probably going to be used more on the uh, in, in the running game and probably in the passing game as well. And it's a, a much, much easier matchup for the Patriots than it is for Kansas city. So uh, we'll both roll with Sony Michelle here. Next question is Tyler Boyd or DJ Moore. I'm assuming it's the same league. So it's going to be standard scoring. How is we feeling right now about 
Boyd versus DJ Moore, Noah? Well, I have a little game split on the Rotoviz game split app. And as you can see, when AJ Green is playing, Boyd is actually like a two point better per game, uh, per, has two points better per game in terms of production for standard leagues. Uh, he's averaging like more receptions, more targets, more yards, more touchdowns. And it should also be taken into consideration that Jeff Driscoll is their quarterback right now. I mean, the guy just likes to run and he dumps it off all the time or he throws it to CJ Uzoma. And it's not a great matchup against the Chargers. I mean, the Chargers have three really good cornerbacks, Desmond King, uh, Casey Hayward, and I'm blanking on the third. But they also Trevor, got Derwin uh, James. Trevor Williams? Yeah. Um, their secondary has just been really good. And um, uh, the implied team total for the Bengals this week is like 16 points. And in the standard league, you want a guy who's going to find the end zone. So if they're not going to score a whole lot, I'm not going to roll out a guy who's not going to find the end zone. Maybe he'll get like five catches for 80 yards. That's eight points in a standard league. DJ Moore, they're getting a nice matchup against Cleveland, who allow the most plays run per game and a higher uh, implied team total. I know Cam Newton didn't look great last week, but he still got eight targets. Um, Devin Funches just looks slow. Greg Olson's out. They don't really have any uh, real like red zone options other than maybe DJ Moore and Christian McCaffrey's always going to get his. So I think it's just it's not simple. But if you just look at the matchup, look at who's playing quarterback, and look at like who's favorites and who's uh, like predicted to score more, I think I'm going to roll with more here. Yeah, I'm with you there, especially the fact that it's standard league. I just, you know, the, the likelihood of DJ Moore getting in the end zone versus Tyler Boyd, in my opinion, is, is a lot higher. So uh, I feel a lot more comfortable with DJ Moore. Just seeing the snap share that he's getting, um, even with all these guys back, like Funches, Torrey Smith are, are finally healthy now. Like you said, they don't look good. Um, and it's really becoming like the more McCaffrey and Curtis Samuel show over there. And it's kind of like a unique dynamic they have between the three of those guys because they're all like small smaller ish you know like playmaker guys you know um after the catch and you actually look at like last week we had tyler boyd who played or two weeks ago we had tyler boyd who played against cleveland went for 785 and a touchdown um and this is a cleveland secondary that's definitely beatable um and i i think more is definitely in store for a bigger game than um tyler boyd with driscoll point total like you said it's gonna be hard for them to score some points so We'll both roll more there. Um, what are we talking about tight end? So he says, Joku is killing me, Vance McDonald or Austin Hooper. Thanks, fellas. I saw you put a little uh, a little chart there from that pro football reference, looking gritty as a motherfucker over there. Why don't you explain yeah. this shit to us, Noah? <laughs> All right. So if you look, I highlighted the three matchups that each one of these guys are getting. Oakland gets Pittsburgh. Carolina gets um, Cleveland. And Green Bay is playing the Falcons. As you can see, Green Bay has allowed one touchdown to the position. And if this guy's in a standard league, I know Hooper's a big guy, and I know that he, they don't use Julio Jones in the red zone, but I'm just not buying that he's going to get enough volume like inside the 20 to really be viable. So I'm just going to throw Hooper out. I know he's been good recently, and he's been pretty consistent, but I'm just I'm not like happy about that matchup one bit. Nah. So then it's really in between the Raiders matchup and the Panthers. Um, and Joku does get the Panthers, which is a good matchup. Before this week, I think they were giving up the most – points i don't know like what happened i thought it was um and then yeah, yeah they were i know for a, probably almost the entire season they were giving up the most fantasy points to tight ends um maybe last week they didn't allow that many and someone overtook them but yeah who did the panthers oh tampa bay and cameron Bray's not going to do shit so, yeah, so, so basically cameron Bray didn't get in the end zone so we didn't do anything yeah and then so it's mostly in between and joku getting the panthers or mcdonald getting the raiders and i just think and Joku has the higher upside. I know Vance McDonald could always break that long touchdown like he did when he put Chris Conti into the shadow realm. But <laughs> I don't know. I think Njoku, he's probably the number two target there. Maybe three if you include, like, Callaway, whatever he's been doing recently. But he's just an athletic freak, and I think he's just going to expose Cleveland this week – or um, Carolina this week. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I, I actually would probably roll the other way. I like. Uh, I would agree that we could throw Hooper out of there. The Green Bay matchup is too tough, and I just don't. As a Falcons fan, I don't trust that offense. I don't. I don't trust Hooper as a player at all. Um, I would go with Vance McDonald, and I know he hasn't been putting up a lot of points, um, but he's getting the targets. Like over his last five games, his target totals have been six, four, six, five, seven, which is semi consistent with about what David Njoku. Actually, it's way better if you look at his last um six games it's six zero five one five six so volume wise i think they're getting around the same thing um what what i like is obviously the matchup the raiders right 
they they play at Oakland, and we just saw the Raiders get absolutely fucking trounced by Travis Kelsey, right? Throwing up like a, a 35 spot for me in fantasy. <laughs> and now we're looking at this this Pittsburgh offense coming in. They're going to be without James Conner, right? So they don't have a back to rely on. A lot of, you know, while their passing game has been super effective this year, they've also been able to kill clock and run down um, opponents by James Conner just, you know, running through them and, and showing that grit and, and killing clock that way. Without him, you know, they're not going to have – they're not going to be giving Jalen Samuels and, and Stephen Ridley, you know, 25 carries this game to chew out the clock, I don't think. So I think they turn to a more pass-heavy approach and just seeing what we – saw um with Travis Kelsey you know he's an athletic tight end similar to Vance McDonald and I think their safeties and their linebackers have a tough time covering those guys so for me I'm gonna roll with Vance McDonald I don't think either of them are necessarily bad plays but um I, I like the uh I like the matchup for McDonald a little more than I like David Njoku yeah I think the real deciding factor here is whether or not uh Mayfield wakes up feeling dangerous <laughs> I, I would agree with that man <laughs> let's go uh to the next question from Ryan Le Moc from Twitter. He asks, looking for high ceiling plays this week. Need to achieve high points for two. Man, you got to work on your fucking spelling or grammar or something, man. I'm having a fucking seizure just trying to read this. Uh, <laughs> looking for high ceiling plays this week. Need to achieve high points to make it into the playoffs. Zay Jones over Diggs. Godwin over Chubb. Josh Allen over Rivers. Half PPR. Uh, okay, so I get what you're, que- I get what you're saying. Like, you – are probably tied with, you know, maybe you're in fifth place, you're tied with the fourth place guy. And the only way you could jump over him if you have the same record is to get more points. You're obviously behind him in points. So you need to make up a point gap. In that situation, um, I mean, this is what I tell people a lot of times when they ask me, like, are you okay starting two guys on the same team, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, at the end of the day, player X is going to have this many fantasy points, player Y is going to have this many fantasy points. The one with more fantasy points is the one you want to have in your lineup, right? doesn't matter who they're playing with. It doesn't matter what their matchups are. Like that's the guy you want to have in your lineup. So I understand where the theory or what you're saying comes from. But when you're looking at things like Zay Jones over Stefan Diggs, Godwin over Chubb, uh, I, I, I don't even – there's no there's, – Zay Jones does not have more upside than Diggs, right? Diggs has put up a 32-point game already this year. He's put up multiple 25-plus point games, a handful of 20-plus point games, where Zay Jones, I get that he's getting kind of hot right now. Um, and, and the same thing with like Chubb and Godwin. Chubb is is getting as much volume as any running. I think Chubb has probably a week over week ceiling of just about as high as any running back in the NFL. Maybe Sands, Todd Gurley right now, um, and Christian McCaffrey. But outside of that, I don't see a lot of guys with a higher ceiling. So I mean, there's no way I'm playing Zay Jones over Diggs. There's no way I'm playing Godwin over Chubb. Although I do love Godwin this week as a play. So if you can get him in your lineup, um, I, I'm not going to be mad at you for that. Is there uh, is there anything? that you're seeing in this, Noah, that I'm just blind to right now with those first two? No, let me just ask you something. I know I probably wouldn't, but would you consider Godwin over Diggs? Uh, that's actually – as soon as I said that last part, I started thinking about it. I guess I'd consider it. I, I think that – what's it's Diggs versus uh, Seattle, right? I think that's the matchup. Yeah, and uh, I think Godwin gets New Orleans. Yeah, you know what? That actually might be a, a, a decent question because the over-under in the, in the Minnesota-Seattle game, I'm, I'm assuming both of these defenses are going to come out ready to play, and this is going to be a defensive-minded game. Um, and, you know, Diggs might be at less than 100%. I know there was the reports all week that, like, his, his knee flared up overnight. Like, I don't know, like, I don't know how – that happens like what leads to you going to sleep and then your knee flaring up while you're in bed I, i'm not gonna you know go into any further about this um, from a medical standpoint but Diggs came out and played four for 49 not a strong game necessarily godwin on the other hand fucking showed out now he gets his game against new orleans at home 56 point over under highest in the uh, nfl this week i guess so you know what with deshaun jackson assuming he's going to be out again i actually don't think it, you know if you're going to do one of them if you're going to fucking mix and match these guys looking for upside, the Godwin over Diggs play, I think, is, is good. Um, so that, that was a good question. Yeah, so I, I, don't hate, I don't hate that. In terms of the quarterbacks, so Josh Allen over Phillip Rivers. This is one I can get behind. Um, and I know Josh Allen is inconsistent, to put it nicely, but upside is absolutely there. And as we were kind of talking about earlier in the video, right, I was looking at some numbers, and the Chargers – are going into this game as 14-point favorites. So they're two touchdown favorites. And I wanted to look at, you know, Phillip Rivers' performance in games where the Chargers, you know, win by a significant number of points. And 
there's a good, it's a perfect sample split because they've won six games this year by eight or more points. And then they have six games where they either, you know, lost or won by less than eight points, a touchdown or less. So in the games where uh, Rivers or the Chargers have won by eight points or more, Rivers' pass attempts have been at 25.8 per game. Um, and he's scored 18 and a half fantasy points. So he hasn't hit 30 pass attempts in any game where they've won by eight or more. And looking at the 25.8 pass attempts per game, if you stretch that out to a season long, um, you know, ratio or whatever pace, that's 413 pass attempts on the year. That's, you know, that would be the lowest of any quarterback in any given season. On the flip side of things, when you look at games in which they have not won by eight points or more, any other game, the six games, he's averaging 37 and a half attempts again uh, versus 25.8 and 20, 21.9 fantasy points a game as opposed to uh, 18 and a half. So there is definitely a reason to worry about Rivers given the fact that they're such heavy favorites and the volume probably won't be there on the passing side of things. You have Allen going against the Jets. Um, it's hard to tell how high of a point total this game is going to be, how much the Buffalo Bills are really going to score. Um, but if there is going to be one, I – would not be mad about playing Josh Allen over Rivers based on, you know, that analysis. Are you uh, – how are you feeling about that, Noah? Yeah, Josh Allen, I mean, he can get it done with his legs. What do you have, like 100-something rushing yards two weeks ago and like 70 last week or maybe even 100. I don't remember. Uh, Philip Rivers has thrown two or more touchdowns in every single game this year. But against the Bengals, I'm not sure that he's going to have to throw. He's not going to need to force it to Tyrell Williams 80 yards down the field. He's not going to need the right tackle to do a false start for uh, Travis Benjamin to torch whoever since he has on the outside. And with Josh Allen, he could just always sling the thing 80 yards and just find the end zone. Even if they put up 17 points this game, would you be surprised if he accounts for two of them and rushes for 100 yards? He yeah, has like it, a pretty high ceiling just because he can use his legs and his, uh, his floor too. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really the thing here is because you, the question you're asking is like you need points, right? And Rivers is obviously the safer floor play. He'll probably give you, you know, 200 yards, two touchdowns. But Josh Allen can give you 100 yards on the ground and, you know, break out that 28, 32 point game any given week. Um, so like you said, yeah, no, I pulled up some of the numbers last week. He had 135 yards on the ground the week prior, 99 yards on the ground. Um, he hasn't been less than 19 in any given week. He has is actually kind of funny. His, he, he has five passing touchdowns on the year, seven interceptions, 191 attempts. So he's basically throwing a touchdown, throwing one passing touchdown, like every 40 pass attempts. But he does have almost 400 rushing yards and four rushing touchdowns in eight games. So he's getting it done on the ground on a consistent basis. And I think that's where you look for upside plays. So um, given the fact that, you know, you're not just looking for the best all around quarterback play, I, I'd be okay going Allen there for, for upside. I definitely wouldn't watch the game though. We'll put it that way. <laughs> um, okay. So let's move on to probably the last question of the video. This is from Gabe. The Gabester. Sick, bro. Gabester 310. What's up? <laughs> Given this year's inconsistent play of tight end, how will you prioritize the Kelseys or the Ertzes of the game in next year's draft? There's no doubt that having a consistent tight end was huge this year. Absolutely. When I'm looking at the leagues that I'm in, pretty much um, two out of the four playoff teams in almost any league, one of them has Ertz, one of them has Kelsey. They've been a consistent piece of those teams. And what I wanted to do, I made this chart. Player W, player K, player L. I don't know why I pick. Actually, I know why I pick those because those are the only like single letters I ever use, like dub K L. And I'm not sure why I translated that into the chart, but these are how we're separating these players. And what this is, I actually should have just fucking put their names to be honest with you. I was going to tell you guys to guess, but now it doesn't really make sense when we're doing it in real time. It's basically a split, right? One of these players is Rob Gronkowski in his best year. One of these players is Zach Ertz's 2018 pace for 16 games. The other player is Travis Kelsey's 16-game pace for 2018. That's what these three lines are. So Rob Gronkowski's best fantasy season, Kelsey Ertz's pace in 2018. Player L is Gronk, right? Player L is Gronk. Finished with 280 fantasy points that year. We're looking at Ertz. We're looking at Kelsey. And the reason I'm doing this is because for a long time, Gronk was a first-round pick, right? A lot of people were taking Gronk top eight, top ten for um, prior to last year, like four or five years in a row. So you're asking, like, how will you prioritize these tight ends now, given that they're producing at almost the same level as Gronk's best fantasy year ever? The fact of the matter is, is, like, even Gronk's, like, okay years, his, like, good years were actually well, well below Kelsey and Ertz's 2018 pace. 
So while Gronk had been like the fucking, you know, the messiah of fantasy tight ends for a long time, Kelsey and Ertz are there, if not better at this point, because the NFL transitioning into more of a passing attack. So, no, do you know which is which right now? Player dub, player K. I'm sure you're actually probably be able to tell just based off the numbers, but um, I kind of do because I was actually looking at uh, Zach Ertz's stats earlier, and I noticed that he was second in the league in reception. So I'm going to go with he's probably player W. And I know Gronk liked to find the end zone, so I'm guessing he's player L, which means player K by process of elimination has to be Jack Doyle. Um, <laughs> Shut your fucking yeah, mouth. Yeah, I got to prioritize tight ends. <laughs> 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 I just, dude, I love me so gritty, great hands. Um, yeah, you got to prior, prioritize those two because if you look at Zach Ertz, as I just said, like he's second in the league in receptions. In a PPR league, that is huge. You're pretty much getting like a top 15 receiver at your tight end position. And even with Kelsey, like he'll get more yards than um, Ertz and a little bit less catches, but he's going to find the end zone more. And in that offense with Patrick Mahomes, as they grow with like their chemistry, he's like a top 12 receiver at the tight end position. So those two guys, I wouldn't hate taking them like back of the second, like high third uh, next year. Yeah, I don't. You're not. You're not going to be able to get them that that late. I don't think in, in drafts next year. I think that they're the reason I wanted to compare them to the Gronks was because we saw how high Gronk was going throughout those prime years of his. So I think Ertz and uh, and Kelsey. And I remember when I was doing a first round mock draft, like halfway through this season, I I redid the first round again. I remember like writing down players that would be considerable parts of the first round. Like guys, I was like, ah, I don't know if they'll make the top 12. And I put Ertz and Kelsey in those, in that bunch. And I was like, ah, probably, I'm not, I don't know if I'd push it that far, but now just looking at how consistent they've been and how much even more production they've put on since that halfway point, it's like, dude, they're like, I think both of them will be top 15, top 18, probably at the latest picks next year. Cause um, they're just so consistent. They don't have health issues. Um, they're both in – well, Kelsey's in a dominant offense, but Ertz is such a big percentage of his offense. And it's like you look at Ertz's on pace for 124 receptions, that would lead the NFL in receptions on, you know, almost almost every single year um, outside of, you know, a year like this or outside of someone going absolutely crazy uh, on any given year. But, like, I, w- I would personally who, – who would you t- – if you could choose one half PPR, which would you take over um, – the other next year and where what's the earliest that you would grab one of them I think I'd still go Kelsey just because Patrick Mahomes is just he's absolutely incredible and he probably has more upside but just because of his like athleticism I know that's not a great argument but he always has the potential to break one I would take him middle of the second probably I would like take him over guys like AJ Green or Stefan Diggs probably I just think his upside is huge and like the opportunity cost as I always bring up like the difference between taking Travis Kelsey and Jack Doyle is huge. It's a way bigger difference than like between Stefan Diggs and like Robert Woods, which like if you trade him off, I don't know. I think he just brings so much value at a position that has absolutely no depth. You got to, you got to roll the dice. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because I, I know a lot of people, I have a lot of friends that, that go into the drafts and do like a zero running back strategy. Right. And um, for the most part, it actually ends up working well. It's not something I like to do because I like to have good running backs on my team, but they'll go really heavy on wide receivers. And I think this year in particular, like 2018 drafts, it was hard to do that. It was hard to take a tight end while doing that strategy because you weren't necessarily really comfortable about any of the tight ends yet, right? Like, you, you know, Kelsey was like a fourth round pick probably, or it's around the same. There was a couple of question marks maybe there. People were a little high on Gronk, but no one wanted to really jump up to like the second round to take him. But this year, you know, you could absolutely – if you're going to go zero running back, you could take a, a top wide receiver round one, and then you can, um, and then you could grab one of these guys in round two and feel really good about your tight end position for the year, and then try to find one of those other skill players down the road or you know waiver wire or later in the draft or whatever. So yeah, I mean I'm with you. I would take Kelsey over Ertz as well, just because that offense, man, and I think his touchdown floor is probably near double digits for the next, you know, four or five years. And uh, the upside, wouldn't be surprised if over the next three or four seasons he matches that 17 touchdown mark that Gronk set back in. That number was all the way back in, like, 2011, too. He hasn't had, I think, it was, like, 2011. He hasn't had a a season like that since. Um, But I just wanted to give everyone a relative view of how high the fantasy community value Gronk during during his prime and what Ertz and Kelsey are doing right now and uh, making the argument that they should be valued about just as high. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think both of them are definitely worthy of top 15 picks, depending on your, your scoring settings and stuff. But um, 
it's an interesting question. So thanks. Thanks for that. Gabester. Keep doing your thing out there, man. And um, I, I think that's probably going to wrap up the Q and A's. I don't know if you saw any other ones on Twitter that came through that you wanted to touch on or anything in general that you wanted to speak on. Now is the time to spew out them big facts only or forever hold your peace. Uh, the only question I had, it relates to the last one is like how many tight ends next year are you like willing to actually draft at their ADP? I can only probably name like five or six, assuming that they're going to fall like within a reasonable place. Like George Kittle, these two guys, OJ Howard, and like who else really? I don't know if I'm really reaching on any tight ends next year. That's true. The only reason I guess you you might fade a Kelsey or an Ertz is because George Kittle will probably be drafted in the fourth-ish round, fourth, fifth round. Hunter Henry is a name that we don't want to forget because obviously he was out all year and he should be, he might be the value pick of next year. He was basically the value pick of this year prior to getting hurt, right? Cause he was going in like the seventh, eighth round and you knew if you have a tight end in that offense, right? He's going to fucking eat and he's going to be a value. So coming off the injury, if people are kind of like pulling back on Hunter Henry and they don't really want to, you know, go all in on him, I will gladly take Henry in like the sixth round and fade one of these tight ends. Um, if that becomes the case. So there's, yeah, Kittle, Hunter Henry, Kelsey, Ertz, um, I'm wondering what Gronk's idea, assuming that he stays in New England, assuming everything kind of stays the same in terms of the dynamic there, I would assume Gronk is probably going to fall back to fourth round ADP, I guess, but I can't really think of too many tight ends I really want to have. I think in terms of OJ Howard, it depends on what they do with Brait. I know he had that fat contract, but most of it was front heavy and they could probably get rid of him this off season um, without losing any dead money uh someone's gonna have to probably fact check me on that but yeah man there's not a lot of uh there's not a lot of positive uh tight ends out there i think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in indy too with luck rolling what they do with the ebron doyle situation bro they should fucking sign devin funches and throw him in the jack doyle role <laughs> it's not like you know what i mean like they i don't know man there's it, it's interesting it's interesting yeah oh there's one that you did forget um jimmy graham he's he's probably gonna go in top two rounds all right, we're done here. That's gonna that's gonna end that's gonna end the video here. Um, all right, well, thank you, Noah, for joining me again on this beautiful Thursday. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, not going out and studying, and good luck on your finals. Everyone, wish Noah good luck on his finals down below. Drop that comment while you're down there. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Make sure you're following both me and Noah on the Twitter, and we will see y'all next episode. So. Yeah.